in your newest edition of the Accidental Superpower, you have written on page 96 that, quote, <laughs> That's awfully specific. <laughs> <laughs> quote, the Russians will use nuclear weapons. Yes, I've got my copy right here. <laughs> what is bringing you to that conclusion? So two things. Uh, number one, the Russians are in a population collapse, not as severe as what's going on in, say, Germany or especially China, but still terminal and still to the point that the Russians are going to be able to cease to function as a military force within about 10 years and within, as a national force in 30 to 40. Uh, so we, we can see the end of this. Uh, they believe, and I think they're broadly accurate in their assessment, that unless they can reposition strategically in a way that is not as manpower intensive, uh, that they're lost. So if you look at the post-Soviet borders of the Russian Federation, they've got about 5,000 miles of contact with other powers that could potentially be hostile. But if they can absorb all of Ukraine and then the next tier of countries beyond them in order to anchor between the Black Sea, the Carpathians and the Baltic, that 5,000 miles shrinks down to about 500 miles and they can maintain that security perimeter with a much smaller military. So we're in this weird situation where uh, I guess it was Elizabeth the Great or excuse me, Catherine the Great who put it the best, I have no option to protect my borders but to expand them. And if they can get back to roughly the old Cold War system, that is a more secure position for them that they can man with fewer troops. What we discovered, however, in the first month of the war is the Russian army isn't an army, it's a mob. And if they are successful in crossing Ukraine and then taking the battle to Romania and Poland, which actually control those access points, they'll come up against NATO, which is the best military force the world has ever seen. And they don't have a chance of winning in a conventional force there. So they would have paid all of the prices for a major war, gotten none of the benefits, and then facing a conventional battlefield defeat. So I would guess, I mean, there's a number of ways that this could go, but if I would guess that the day after Ukraine falls, the Russians reposition their forces, get ready to march on the Danube and the Vistula and, and Warsaw, and call up Paris and London and Sweden and Stockholm and say, look, we're going to fire nukes at your cities tomorrow unless you publicly repudiate the NATO alliance with Romania, with Poland, with Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, you let us know what you decide. The missiles fly at noon. Mm some version of that mm. uh that is the that's the negative mm. scenario i'm not sure how i should say this that that is the ukraine loss scenario and that is the path that we risk being on now the flip side is if ukraine wins and achieves everything we've always hoped and gets all the russians off of all of their land it's not enough because the russians now have launched a major war and not gotten the benefits of it yet so they will try again and again and again and again and again. And that means that for the Ukrainians to be secure, they have to neutralize the logistical hubs within Russia proper that allow Russians to gather and launch conflicts. Those two cities, Belgorod and rostov on you know, they're on the wrong side of the border. Hmm. And if the Ukrainians do something to neutralize them, then the Russians will feel that they have to launch nukes for defensive reasons. So we're in this weird, horrible holding pattern where the best case scenario for everyone except for the ukrainians is for the war to stay in ukraine hmm. wow, that's remarkable uh, peter with the with the nato scenario it sounds like then nuclear weapons are um are a, a threat to be used to break alliances and, and perhaps will not be used should those alliances break is that is that what i'm gathering if the Germans and the Swedes and the Brits and the French agree to give the Russians everything that they want then maybe nukes won't be used. Mm. But I think if there's one thing that we've seen out of Putin and in Europe in general, is that when you give a dick everything he wants, he asks for more. Mm. So while uh, the Vistula and the Danube are the minimum criteria for the Russian success, they're not the maximum, that would include Berlin. Mm. That would include all of Hungary. That would include all of Romania and Bulgaria. So uh, it's difficult. I mean, Predicting what people are going to do in that situation is obviously difficult, but to think that everyone in NATO has a military is just going to roll over, that ignores a lot of European history. Hmm. Yes. You are in the prediction business. You did predict the invasion of Ukraine in the first edition of the Accidental Superpower. Um, in your newest edition, you now refer to this war as Russia's Twilight War. We've started to talk a little bit about this, but but what does that twilight for Russia look like in your eyes? If Russia fails here, they'll be unmoored in their own territory and lacking enough people in their 20s to launch another conflict. 
continue at the current pace they've been going for the last two years for at least, at least another four or five uh, before they run out of equipment and men. Um, but this is the last generation of Russian men in their 20s. Uh, the birth rate just collapses after this. So if they were going to do it, they had to do it now. And they are preparing for a world where they have very, very few men that can patrol their own population as well as their external borders. So this is Russia's last major war. And after this, it's just a question of the long fade. And does the long fade happen over two decades or does it happen over seven? They're fighting for time, plain and simple. Hmm. I think you've, you've written that you have been surprised by some things in how this so war played things. out. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and in this specifically with, with how Russia has acted and how the U.S. has acted, um, could you share what, what has surprised you about this conflict? Everything. Uh, everyone... <laughs> in my field was convinced that the Ukrainians ultimately wouldn't have a chance. Now, I would say that I was one of them that was most optimistic. Mm -hmm. I'd seen the efforts towards national consolidation and military uh, shifts in the, um, the post-2014 era is very, very positive, but not enough to make them last more than a year. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so uh, in the first month of the war, when it looked like it was almost all over, uh, with the assault on Kiev, we're like, wow, I knew it was going to be quick. I really didn't think it was going to be that quick. And then the military advance by the Russians stalled and dissolved. And I was like, wow, didn't see that coming. I knew that the military in Russia wasn't as good as they said it was, but I thought it was still the second most powerful military in the world. And now here we are two years later, and everything, every assessment, I think, that everyone made pre-war has been proven wrong. And I think everyone's adjustments have also been proven wrong. So just mm -hmm. my personal story, thought that this would be over in a year, here we are. Thought the Russians were more capable, here we are. Thought the Europeans wouldn't step up, here we are. Thought the Americans wouldn't step up, and then they did, and now they're stepping back. Mm -hmm. uh, the... We're all getting a fresh appreciation that the term fog of war does not simply apply to battlefield conditions. Uh, and I would love to be able to give you a firm forecast about what's going to happen next, but I don't trust it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I focus on what I see and the implications for the evolutions at the moment, which of course right now, unfortunately, are more in Washington than they are on the front. Uh, but I've definitely been severely humbled, and anyone who hasn't been severely humbled has not been paying attention and being honest with themselves. From your work, too, I've, I've gathered that for Ukraine, it seems that even if uh, they are to succeed in defending against Russia, that things look bleak for them as a nation, particularly with the loss of so many men, uh, so many women have fled. And, and you've even written, I'm, I'm not sure if I quite understand, but the, the, there are perhaps even um, kidnappings of their children through this this conflict that's happening so um what what could work for ukraine or is it is it all over for them either way it is all over for them either way the question mm. is how do they leave this earth mm. uh, right now a third of the population are refugees either outside of the country primarily or elsewhere within the country um most of the refugees, probably close to 75% are women and children, and mm -hmm. most of the women who adv have advanced degrees have left. Mm -hmm. So they've lost their intellectual capital, they've lost their youth, they've lost their next generation, and they already had one of the world's worst demographic structures anyway as a result of the post-Cold War collapse. And that's before you consider the destruction because of the, the war or soldiers that are lost, which are almost exclusively under 40. Uh, so even if the Ukrainians win here, we are still in the final generation of the Ukrainian state. And considering that there's not a single place that the Ukrainians have fled to, they're throughout Europe. The dissolution of the ethnic identity itself now is pretty much baked into the cake. Uh, and there, there isn't a future here. Now, some version of that is true for the Russians as well. The Russian birth rate is officially higher but uh officially the data is made up <laughs> they just stopped collecting it 15 20 years ago so i have no doubt that the russians are in a much a very similar situation so we're looking at this entire eastern european western eurasian land mass depopulating and this region doesn't border a zone that has positive population growth so we're going to get a real world experience here of what depopulation means for things like industrial structure because when you lose the population that's necessary to maintain basic infrastructure you know we've we've never seen that before the closest you might be able to draw upon in the united states 
is the hollowing out of the steel belt, which happened over a much longer part of period of time and was still part of this overarching government that could shift funds from somewhere else to the Rust Belt to keep it going. Ukraine and Western Russia have nothing like that. Hmm. Moving on to the European Union a bit, you've also written that the Ukraine war has, has given impetus to the European Union. Um, what are you noticing there as a result of the Ukraine war? It's, uh, it's interesting. So um, the EU was never an institution, or at least in the last 15 years, that have been overly impressed by. They tend to have long drawn out arguments over the most pointless things and decisions that the Americans can literally make in an hour or two. I mean, we, we beat ourselves up about how long it takes to do anything here. It's nothing compared to Europe. Oh my God. It's like our, our, our bailout, for example, for the subprime situation, from genesis to first application, that was under a week. Hmm. The Europeans, it took 14 years. I mean, they still haven't fully implemented the bailout program from 2007. Hmm. Just the degree to which it just everything just drags on forever uh, is almost painful. But then the Ukraine war happened, and all of a sudden they issued their first joint bond and started buying ammo. Uh, it's like, you know, having the barbarians at the gate has a way, that's probably the wrong phrase, having the wolves at the door is, it has a way of focusing minds. Uh, and so we're seeing more action, more thoughtfulness, more looking over the horizon in Europe for the first time since the Nazis were around. And that's quietly amazing in its own way. I mean, I still think Europe's doomed. Their demographics aren't much better than the Russians or the Ukrainians. And this is still a bit of a starvation diet as once you consider things like deglobalization. But to actually be facing their problems head on and putting resources to buying themselves more time, we've not seen that in Europe in modern history at all. Mm. And now it's here. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about those those threats to Europe that you're talking about, the, the demographics, the, the changes in the economy. You've also written, quote, Europe will still die. Um, what yeah. what will be the end if they if they seem to keep moving on despite Brexit, despite these changes? There's a thousand ways that they can. It's <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so um when they started confiscating insured bank deposits for their financial bailouts back in 07 and 09, uh, that basically ended the euro as a meaningful currency on the global stage. So they are trapped in a regional currency system. Uh, their demographic situation means that they're no longer consumption-based society. It's all about exports, but their demographics have now aged to the point that the exports are in danger because they're losing their workforce. Uh, a lot of the countries in Europe, Germany at the top of the list, were convinced that history was over, so you can get your energy from wherever you want. So they got it all from Russia. That's now gone to zero and the replacement supplies aren't nearly as inexpensive so we're looking at a complete collapse of the industrial model in germany it's not just germany germany is the center of a manufacturing hub that involves belgium the netherlands denmark austria uh, switzerland poland czech republic slovakia and hungary and romania that all dies without the germans and the french were never in the eu for economic integration it was about strategic power and so they've never integrated their economic systems so they're i don't want to say fine but they're in much better shape and they will absolutely go their own way if they're expected to pay for germany so every pillar of support and understanding every bit of intellectual foundation that has undergirded the eu has now been proven wrong and terminal and so we either get a complete reimagination of the european alliance that uses a different economic model than socialism or capitalism or it just dies hmm. and i think it just dying is more likely now this isn't the end of the idea of Europe, but it will have to be reinvented on the other side of this break. And it's gonna look very, very different. And if this is the first time that Europe has ever gone through traumatic change without a military conflict, that would be amazing, but it would be betting against history. For Great Britain, what, what role do you see in all of this? Do you, do you see them being uh, interconnected and, and, and suffering as well? Or do you see them sort of rising along with the US and, and being secure and detached? That's up to them, and they're having a hard time making up their damn minds. Um, so when the topic of Brexit first came up, I was like, well, that's logical. If you're like me and you see that there's an end of the road in the European Union, then getting out well before that end and starting on whatever's next makes a lot of sense. And so I wasn't shocked when Brexit passed the referendum. What shocked me 
is that we have now been through four governments in Britain that haven't figured out what's next. And the topic of what next is not really a topic for the election that's coming up. It just the, the, the degree that the Brits have lied to themselves and just absorbed that into their political life is, is stunning. Um, and it means that their options are becoming very limited. Uh, if you are going to be part of a trading block, you either want it to be close, like the EU, or you want it to have a strong economy and especially a relatively young economy, demographically speaking, so that it can consume what you produce. Well, if the EU is not part of that, and uh, even if the Brits go back right now, I don't think they would get let in. The only other option is the United States, and that means joining functionally NAFTA in some way. That means you have to do it on NAFTA's terms, specifically America's terms. And that means things that the UK has going on in agriculture, in manufacturing, in energy, and especially in finance have to be resolved to American preferences. So when the Brexiteers were lying to the voters about the fact that they could get a free trade deal with the United States and easily and get better terms than they got from EU, I mean, they literally just made that shit up. And as soon as the British negotiating team came to the Trump administration to ask for terms, they left ashen face with how horrible the terms were going to be. Biden comes in, they come back like new president, better deal. No, terms are the same. Mm -hmm. So until such time as the decision makers in London, regardless of the political parties, realize that your options now are be a middle power that doesn't matter economically in a box with a terminal demography where things are fading day by day, or give up your economic sovereignty in order to join a more dynamic system where growth can be guaranteed over the long term, but you are not the decision maker. I mean, that's a tough decision, I'll admit it, but they should have seen this coming eight years ago. Hmm. I mean, any Brit who has a realistic understanding of British history since 1930 realizes when it comes to trade, when it comes to anything, the Americans are not pushover negotiators, but they chose to ignore that. And that has landed them in this little nether world where London is stewing in its own juices and the situation is getting worse month by month. Talk, talk to, to China, Peter. Um, you, you've written that, that for China, that they are perhaps still seen as a, as a, you know, a growing power over the last 10 years, but that they are insulated from their poor geography by things like external circumstances and good internal governance. Um, what would indicate the end of those external circumstances for China? Well, deglobalization is a big piece of it. Uh, one of the reasons why the Chinese have been so successful since 1980 is because of their integration with the American-led economic order. Uh, the Americans provided the military overwatch that has allowed their corporate activities to span the world. Without the U.S. Navy, there is no modern industrialized China. And there was an understanding of that a few years ago. And so the question was, how do we come to a, an understanding now that the Americans are finally getting done with the Middle East? But then COVID happened and Trump happened and deglobalization happened and populism happened and the Biden administration is now actually more economically nationalist than Trump was. And no matter who wins in November, it's only going to get worse for the Chinese. Uh, you add their demographic issues on top of that, and we are really looking at the end of the Chinese system. And a bit like Europe, it's now there are so many things that are so fragile and so broken. It's kind of an open contest as to what the proverbial bullet to the brain is going to be because there are so many bullets in the air right now. Um, also on top of that, since I spoke to you, health, in the last two weeks, uh, the demographic data out of China has gone from horrible and unprecedented to something much darker. Hmm. They're now, we haven't confirmed this yet. This is just in the last two weeks. I haven't confirmed it yet, but that the number of kids entering kindergarten is less than half of what it was just since COVID. Hmm. Um, and so just, the degree of population collapse there is something that has never been recorded in any age. It's worse than what happened to the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. Mm. It's just getting your mind around how dramatic the Chinese end is going to be and how soon it's going to be is difficult. My understanding of your writing is that previous administrations in China had, had strong internal decision making. and Very. Now we're seeing an, an evolution in that. Um, what are you seeing as far as the decision making internally that is harming China's success? So we, we've kind of been there and back again now. Um, 
when Deng Xiaoping ended the Maoist era and opened the Chinese to the world, uh, he was the man and everything stopped with him. But this is a country that at the time had an economy that was you know, at most a fifth of what it is today. So if you're a relatively technologically backwards economy, you can have a single decision maker to push broad strategies because the options are relatively limited. You can do agriculture, you can do processing, you can do textiles, that's about it. And as the economy started to expand, he realized he was wise enough, humble enough to realize that it wasn't a one-man job anymore. So what he did is he went out and he made connections to these two big factions, one in the north of the country, one in the south of the country. The north one obviously around Beijing, the south one obviously around Shanghai, and set up a balance of power and selected two men specifically, Zhang Zemin from the south, Hu Jintao from the north, and had them basically build a system where for the next 20 years, the two factions would balance each other and take turns in the big chair. So we had 10 years under Zhang Zemin, we had 10 years under Hu Jintao. And in doing so, and by bringing in hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people who could operate at the local and province level, you got this broad-based committee style approach to economic and political management. It wasn't perfect, but for the stage of development that China was going through, it was all about the growth and it was about spreading out political power so that there weren't too many internal fights. And for 20 years that worked. But again, Ding was smart enough to know what he didn't know. And he could look forward 20 years and realize that he couldn't figure out what's next. He, he just, who knows what was gonna happen with technology in China and the world in that environment. So the last task he gave the Hu faction and the Zhang's faction before he stepped back and retired was the two of you have to jointly select who's next. Hmm. You have to elevate a candidate to secede you. And the person they chose was absolutely the wrong person. And that's Xi Jinping, who's the guy now. Hmm. They chose him because he didn't have a faction and they chose him because they thought he wasn't very smart and could be manipulated. And they were so very wrong. And so he, Xi Jinping has basically now purged these two broad economically and politically competent factions from the entire system completely. They're, they're gone. It would be like if Trump and Biden were to jointly pick who the next president is, and then the next president would basically criminalize the Republican and Democratic Party and put mm. them all in camps. That's the scale of what's happened here. Mm. And Xi, in doing so, has destroyed the old corporate committee style of governance and replaced it with Deng Xiaoping style one man rule, but with a system that is vastly more complicated and far reaching and something that no one person could ever control and command competently. And so the place has fallen apart hmm. and we're seeing decision-making collapses across the entire network because Xi has established himself as the sole decision maker, but made damn sure that there's no one in the bureaucracy who is capable because that might be a potential threat to him. And he's destroyed the ability of younger generations to get into governance at all. Hmm. So it's just him, but there's no information flow and he's making decisions alone in the dark based on whatever the status of the conversation of the voices in his head are and completely oblivious to what's going on in the wider world. And so hmm. on top of all the other problems the Chinese are having, their government has stopped functioning. So, Peter, then, if China has lost these external circumstances that were so favorable or is in the process of losing them, their internal decision making is getting worse. And even if that's totally off base, their demographic situation is catastrophic. What is the steel man argument, the best argument for the strength of China going forward? That the United States will is not serious when it says it wants to renationalize things, that it's not serious when it mm -hmm. says it that it's afraid of China and that it's going to pay trillions of dollars in order to defend China's corporate interests on a global basis, which ironically has been what most of the American business community has been betting on the last few years. And that's a bad bet. <laughs> yeah. Yes, agreed. Well, Peter, before I ask my last question, uh, where should folks look for you online? Uh, Zion.com, Z-E-I-H-A-N.com slash newsletter. That's how you sign up for the video log. It's free. I will never share your data with anyone. And that is always where it will post first. Excellent. Well, Peter, my final question is, uh, for us in the United States, despite our, our internal difficulties, I wonder, what do you see that could unite us in geopolitical strategy? Or what is a, what is a strategy worth pursuing? 
Well, okay, look at it this way. Um, Pre-World War II, we had a foreign policy that was a little bit like what we have today with significant shifts between the two parties based on who would win. Uh, I'm oversimplifying here, but as a rule, it was all about our relationship with our former colonial master, the Brits. It's like, are we hostile to them? Are we willing to talk to them? Are we isolationist? Are we interventionist? That was kind of the swing. And then during the Cold War, we had a very strongly bipartisan foreign policy that was all about the Soviets. And any differences between the Democrats and the Republicans between 1945 and roughly 2015 was really just about the shading. Uh, everyone agreed on the big issues. What we're going through right now is a once in a generation transformation of our political processes as the factions that make up our parties fall out of alliance with one another, move around and form new alliances. And until those two new alliances are solidified, which we're still a few years away from, it's difficult to know exactly what our foreign policy is going to be. We're in a transition period right now. And that means that everything is in flux because we've got some folks who are realizing that the world we're in today from a national security point of view is a lot like the Cold War. And so a lot of the decision-making processes that we had from the Cold War are actually appropriate right now. Um, Donald Trump would call these people rhinos. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also have the mainline Democrats who still remember that bipartisan foreign policy. And even if they were uncomfortable with it, they realize it's broadly appropriate for the moment. Uh, on the other side, the more activist side, you've got the Trumpian Republicans who have been completely overwhelmed with propaganda from the Republican Party in a way that the left-wing Democrats used to guzzle it like it was the Jews of the gods. And so we've got this weird situation where Republican propaganda has shown up on the periphery of the political system, but has gotten their claws into both factions for different reasons uh, and are playing against the middle. You do that in a time of political transformation, and it makes it very, very difficult to have any foreign policy that requires Congress whatsoever. And since Congress controls the power of the purse, that's kind of relevant. So it's weird that we've got these centrist factions with the president who understand what's at play and understand broadly what needs to be done. And seeing that degree of consensus in Washington, especially now, is kind of amazing but there are enough people on both sides that have just given themselves away to a foreign government that just makes shit up uh, is as concerning as the first thing is somewhat inspiring. Uh, and so it's just a mess. Uh, and until such time as we have uh, another federal election, November, uh, mm -hmm. that maybe clarifies a few things in Congress, mm -hmm. this is just where we are. And that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get the right outcome hmm. come November, because again, we're in a period of political transition. The Democrats, Republicans, they don't mean what they used to. And we didn't know that this is where we were going to be with this Congress until it was elected. So the soonest you should expect any meaningful shift and improvement is next January when the new Congress sits. But that doesn't mean it's going to get better, at least not in the short term. Okay. Well, Peter, this is when it'll change. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for um, doing the work to to help us all understand these things, communicating it in a way that is, is both informative and entertaining. Uh, your newest book is the 10-year edition, the, the Accidental Superpower, 10 years on. Thank you so much for joining me again. Not a problem. Thanks for watching this episode with Peter Zion. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And if you're new here, I'm Brad Carr. I do interviews like this with popular authors. And the best way to support this channel is to share this episode with other people.